Hello, please let me see your ticket subs for the Double Edge Double Bill. This week we enjoy 2019 so far with replicas of us. week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin and yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 in order to seal their fates for the next episode. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Let the chaos begin. I am Thomas Mariani. And I am Adam Thomas, or am I? Which version of him? What would your evil double's name be? Mata Samat. His cover flown on? Phenomenal. Yeah, um, <laughs> but uh, yes, this week uh, we are discussing honor of 2019. We are halfway through it. Um, hard to imagine. Um, it's felt like a bit as the last few years have felt. It's felt yeah. like a lot in six months uh, necessarily. Um, but the year so far has been interesting, especially Adam. I know you've made it a big thing for you this year to watch more films because last year when we did a similar thing for 2018, you hadn't seen shit. And yeah. I think now you've seen at least like a handful of stuff, right? You're a bit more cut up on the modern films. I've been trying to see everything I can when I can. I mean, still, there's a lot out there I didn't get a chance to yet. But yeah, I've been trying to get to the show or, you know, stream more that I haven't seen before and stuff like that. So yeah, it's been interesting so far for me because I usually tend to keep up, but I have like the AMC A-list stubs thing. Uh-huh. You just pay like a 25 bucks a month and you can see like three movies a week at the most. And I haven't found myself really wanting to go to the movies, especially this summer has been very lackluster, really. Yeah, there hasn't been really anything so far this summer. Uh, usually we would have gotten one by now. Yeah, because, I mean, you, you, would you count Avengers since it technically came out in April? No, I wouldn't count it as the start of the summer. No, that was... So, I mean, that's usually, you know, well, obviously the beginning of this month. Usually about the beginning of June, I, I would say, is when the real big summer ones start coming. But, I mean, even then, for, I'd say, the last decade or so, May has tended to be kind of like the start of That's the true. movie summer, generally. Um, and, I mean, honestly, really, in terms of summer stuff, it's been like John Wick Chapter 3 has pretty much been the most interesting one that's come out. And I even had issues with that. Most of the really good movies that have come out so far have been in, like, the spring. That's when we got a lot of the more interesting, weirder choices. Um, and even our two movies uh, came out, one in March, then the other one in January. Because uh, we were talking about uh, our good pick, which we picked at the end of our last episode, is Us, as was one of my choices. And our bad film uh, is Replicas, which was technically a choice by Adam, but uh, you, the people out there, voted for it. Uh, because we put out a poll on our Facebook and our Twitter pages, at Pod for both. And uh, you guys ended up picking Replicas for us. And uh, we thank all of you who voted, and we'll make sure uh, to do that again in the near future for a different episode. Yeah, two uh, movies that do have at least uh, some similarities and themes. It's just insane that I literally realized that today. <laughs> <laughs> As you were watching the movies. Yes, yeah, so why don't we go ahead and get started with the bad feature this time, Replicas. It'll be like it never happened. What's going on? William, something's not right with me. Tell me the truth. There was a crash. You and the kids died. Initiate. I brought you back. How could you do this? Because I love you. So, uh, Replicas came out in uh, January... The month where all the good movies come out. January 11, 2019. It stars Keanu Reeves, who we kind of have referenced this before. That We did a Keanu Reeves episode a few episodes ago in honor of John Wick Chapter 3. And we recorded that episode right before that movie came out and was a surprise massive hit in the summer, given the other ones in those franchises came out in like February and October. Um, and from there, Keanu has had a bit of a moment for himself in 2019. Yeah, I would call it like a uh, resurgence because he's kind of been around forever as far as you know still in movies there theater stuff but it's definitely like whatever the hell is going on has revitalized him for sure 
one may call it a Keanu sense. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, a Reva sense. A Reeve surgeons. Yes. Uh... Uh, let's stop all that. <laughs> I, I mean, you're right. He has been around to some degree, but I don't think he's been quite as popular since I would say the John Wick franchise, where like the first John Wick was sort of like a surprise hit when it came out in 2014, and yeah. even John Wick Chapter Two was also pretty uh, surprised. But he was still in some forgettable, underwhelming movies in between those, um, like Knock Knock, the Eli Roth film everyone loves. He's really funny in that movie, though. It was free pizza. You fucked me. <laughs> Hilarious. Ever since, pretty much, John Wick Chapter 3, he's been on a bit of a role where he was in that. Then he was in the Netflix romantic comedy Always Be My Maybe, in a cameo as himself, we, and he's hilarious in that. And then he was even in Toy Story 4 as a Duke Kaboom. And uh, also he's going to be in that cyberpunk video game. He was at yep. E3. He's being courted by Marvel. Right, there's a lot of talk about that, and I mean, he's also just, him doing the sort of press rounds for all those things has had so many great moments, like my favorite probably being when he's, I think it's for John Wick 3, he just goes up to the mic and says, I love movies, I love watching them, and I love making them. <laughs> great, phenomenal, or of course the thing at the E3 thing where you announced the Cyberpunk 2077, where someone was like, you're beautiful! And he's like, you're beautiful! You're all beautiful! <laughs> Stuff like that. It, it shows that like we're not just having a renaissance for his acting career, but also just a lot more appreciation for Keanu as a person, which he's always consistently, from what I've heard, been a very nice, warm, welcome person. But before all that happened, earlier this year, uh, he was in Replicas, which is a movie he produced, um, and was, uh, I guess, sort of like the sacrificial lamb for his yeah. career resurgence. Replicas had to die so that his career could continue from there, because this is actually interesting. This is the lowest grossing wide release in his entire career at $4.06 million, and actually is currently the record holder for the biggest drop from first weekend to second weekend at 81.5%. For perspective, opening weekend it made $2.3 million, and then second weekend it made 439000 Nice. Well, you know, and the thing is, too, it was supposed to be a Nicolas Cage lead role. Right, it feels like it, too. <laughs> oh, 100%. <laughs> Although either of them is a neuroscientist. You're like, eh, I don't know about this. <laughs> what are you talking about? I know the brain very well. Didn't you see me doing my minority report? Style oh, God, I'm so tired of that fucking shtick, too. <laughs> oh... <laughs> It's actually produced by him as well through his production company, uh, Company Films, uh, which, <laughs> great title. Of course, Keanu Reeves' like production company is called Company. We should call our company Company. Well. well. <laughs> and, of course, it, I also love it's one of the many production companies at the beginning of this movie. Like, this is one of those movies that's financed by, like, 15 different companies, so you get, like, thousands of logos at the beginning. Is an, a studio I've heard about in recent years called Entertainment Studios, which sounds like a mob front. Yes. Like, yeah, we produce our films through uh, entertainment studios. Yeah, that's what we do. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And this movie clocks in at what, like an hour and 47 minutes or something like that? Yeah. It feels like it's three and it's, a half hours long. It, it, it's a bit long. But you know what, Adam? You chose Oof. this. I don't uh, know so... why. Because <laughs> you didn't have any other options, I guess. Uh, but um, why don't you go a bit into a plot synopsis, uh, since this is a newer film that mo most people might not know, um, and then your own initial thoughts. I think as we should also say, before you even do that, um, these are more recent movies, so we don't usually do this because we talk about older movies, but I guess a spoiler warning is yeah. deserved yeah, to be yeah. out there. It's also kind of weird because I think both our movies take certain twists and turns, but I would argue Replicas has the more I didn't expect them choices in that you're like, wait, why is this happening? Yeah, right. Yes, I agree with that. <laughs> but go ahead, Adam. Uh, Replica stars everyone's boy at the moment. Piano Keys as a neuroscientist who's trying to map the human mind into synthetic brains. And then he goes away on vacation. Because why not? When you're in the middle of work and there's a colossal failure, you just back up and leave. With his wife and three kids. Well, they get into a car wreck. His whole family dies. He's unscathed somehow. And then he uh, calls the fucking Verizon guy to help him clone them. 
because apparently they've done that before with animals and rats. So they're not even robots. So why do they do the whole synthetic brain thing in the beginning? Don't know. Doesn't matter. Doesn't apply until the end. And then that's about it. It's about 35, 40 minutes of Keanu Reeves wait for them to hatch. And then when they do, it gets really stupid. <laughs> and I guess that's just your general thoughts on the movie, Adam. Yeah, I... Uh... I have so many problems with this movie. It's so sloppy. I'm dead, aren't I? Yeah. I, I watched the kids die. I held you in my arms. What was I supposed to do? And it's almost like she doesn't say it, but you can. Oh, well, in that case, I forgive you. Like, that's basically what happens. And, oh, yeah. You made me forget one of my own children? Okay. Well, <laughs> you rascal. Like, this, this movie fucking sucks so bad. <laughs> And the special effects, oh, the synthetic Keanu. There's a lot I want to talk about with synthetic Keanu. <laughs> oh, well, please, the f the floor is yours. Well, I, I will say, I do agree that generally this movie is pretty bad. It's this weird thing where it's, um, w with most bad ones we talk about in the show, uh, there tend to be three different varieties. There's genuinely just really bad, doesn't work. Uh, there's so bad it's good, where it's entertaining despite how bad it might be. And then there's also, oh, what the fuck, we're doing this kind of yeah. bad, where you're not entertained, but you're engrossed because you're like, I can't believe it's uh, this is happening. Um, this movie's all three, I would argue. It has all shades of the different bad movies in here. Because I, I did not find it entertaining at all. I will say, I think the biggest entertaining block, I say there's like, it's a solid 15, 20 minute section of this movie, is after his family dies, um, and he's growing those genetic pods, there's two specific sort of sequences that happen that I was actually quite kind of like engrossed or interested or like, oh, I haven't seen this in one of these sort of sci-fi movies before. When Thomas Middleditch, as you mentioned, plays his Igor of sorts. Yeah. Who, um, Keanu asks a lot of him. He's just like, I want you to dispose of the body of my family. Yeah. You choose which one that I don't bring back to life. It's your well, choice. He, right, I want you to steal these three cloning pods and then when I realize, oh wait, I can't grow all four family members because there's only three pods, I want you to pick the one. <laughs> um, but that whole element I actually really thought was interesting of like, okay, your limitations are you only have three pods so I have to pick one of these four family members that I have to like completely not bring back. And I thought that was an interesting idea. And I thought that was actually pretty well performed by Keanu. And then also, after that point, when he starts, like, actually going back to work, and Thomas Miller just uh, has to encounter, like, the principal at the kid's school, he's like, didn't you ever realize that, like, other people are going to, like, miss your family? And are going to, like, want to know where the fuck they are? And there's a whole sequence where Keanu has to, like, text uh, his daughter's friends as his daughter, and then, like, also text on, like, the MMO for his son, like, his clan that he goes on with the video game, and then also email his wife's, like, co-workers at the clinic, <laughs> and all this other shit. It's like, I've never seen one of these sci-fi movies actually deal with that idea. That it's like, oh, wait, there's a whole life my family had <laughs> that I have to right. like, cover up for. I almost wish that was more of the movie, and you had to have Keanu have to text about, like, uh, like his daughter's friends, but just like, did you see that new Cardi B single? OMG, dog. Can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. She is bad and bougie. Um, <laughs> no, nah, but it's like, okay, I get all that, and, I, and you're right. I, I've never really seen it addressed thoroughly like that before. But there still in lies the huge problem is that all these other people are going to remember the other child. Yep. <laughs> and it will be brought up you would think at one point to one of the other family members, like, Hey, what's your sister Zoe? Who? <laughs> right. Because Keanu also has to erase their memories in another pretty un unintentionally funny scene where he has to like search the memory banks of his family members and delete his daughter <laughs> where it's like, okay, that's how the human brain works, right? You can just search like Zoe and just erase all of that. Sure. Right, but he also, but, and in doing that, he forgets to erase his one daughter's memory of seeing the mother die. <laughs> yep. You think you'd take care of that one first, you know, the death that you brought them back from, you think you'd take that out. And then they do the thing with like the son where he's got like no motor functions and he's doing weird shit, like throwing his food into, into cups instead or no. And they go nowhere with it. Yeah, and there's a similar thing with his wife where, like, she's running and she can't quite control her motor functions. Right. So it's like they can't quite get so used to their body. So she's got the phantom pain from where she was killed. Yes. 
nothing. They do nothing with it. No, that's the biggest problem, is honestly, once the family comes back, it brings up just... Because you go one of two ways, right? You go, like, Pet cemetery, where they're not right. And, you know, Thomas Mill just like, sometimes dead's better. Right. Um, I or, told you. Uh, you know. <laughs> well, sometimes dead's better. What's <laughs> the <Silicon laughs> Valley, HBO? <laughs> um, or you could go that way, or you could go the way of, like, him having to constantly hide stuff from them. And they just kind of drop either or. And especially, like, they just rob a lot of sort of the um, consequence for Keanu Reeves after that point. Because as you mentioned, his family just seems kind of cool. Like, oh, okay. I mean, I guess. <laughs> you had to do what you had to do. Just don't you do it again. <laughs> for most of the movie, admittingly, I think Keanu's kind of playing it in VOD mode, um, where it feels like he's kind of on autopilot. Um, but I think there are certain moments where he gets to either act genuinely dramatically or be very over-the-top Shatnery, which is my favorite stuff. <laughs> like, there's a point where um, they have to, like, put all the clothing machines around. Thomas Miller is like, hey, look, you have to, like, keep them on all the time. You have to get, like, a generator. And he's like, it's 2 a.m. Nothing's open. <laughs> which <laughs> yeah, is hilarious. Right. Um, and then also when the family members are all back and they're like, hey, Dad, can we have, like, French toast and sausage or whatever? He's like, sure. <laughs> Au revoir, madame. Of course. I shall bring you all sorts of meals. I'm right. so happy to be Dad again. <laughs> oh, they sold us expired milk. I promise you I will have strong words with someone. <laughs> yeah. Like, get the fuck out of here with this. It's also just really weird considering, if you know anything about Keanu's past, um, that he would not only be in this, but produce it. This movie about, like, him having family members who die horribly in a car accident. Yeah, it's... It's, it's interesting. I think it's kind of like he's kind of working through something. Yeah, maybe it's cathartic, but... Maybe it's a bit cathartic, um, but there's also just stuff like... <laughs> The, the whole background thing of, like, this technology he's developing with this robot, um, who, you didn't mention this earlier, but, like, it's failing because, like, they have this opening scene where they try and put, like, a dead soldier, his consciousness, into this robot, and he's just like, oh, why am I? Why? He's just, like, pulling off his face and shit, and he's like, well, I guess that didn't work. Uh, <laughs> what do we do now? And then, about an hour later, they come up with the problem, the solve. Right, where it's just like, oh. It's love, basically. It's, 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 it's the just... body. The body needs to feel its own heart. You're like, what? <laughs> this is so fucking ridiculous. Which doesn't make any sense within the later twist that makes just absolutely no sense. Where he's like, hmm, how do I get around this thing where John Ortiz, a.k.a. everyone's favorite bad guy, in yep. his, like, B-grade movies, who's like... Oh hey, you know you did this, and um, you're gonna have to kill your family. Uh, even though I, <laughs> I, I guess we could just keep the secret, and you could just work for me forever, so you can have your family. But no, I want you to kill all of your family members. The things that you did that we wanted you to do, and you did it expertly. We're gonna kill them. <laughs> but uh, basically, like he, he has the dilemma of hmm, I I have to like keep that guy satiated with what he wants, but I also want to live my life alone with my family. What do I do? Oh, I'll download a copy of my consciousness into this robot. Yeah. And that'll solve everything. That's super strong and bulletproof. Right, yes. Suddenly. Because that's know, like... necessary, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and that robot has, like, sub-eye robot level special effects. Oh, it's atrocious looking. <laughs> It is so bad. Plus, dude, I am so tired of the, you thought we were working in medicine? We're actually doing arms development. I'm so tired of that shtick in movies mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, the company I was working for is not exactly what I thought it was. They're going to use my work for evil. Like, get the fuck out of here with all of this. And then it's just the guy ends up in Dubai with the robot. Well, right later, admittingly, most of the movie takes place in Puerto Rico. Which is right. interesting. I guess, like, this is this a tax cut thing? Yeah, yeah. it has to be. I'm, I'm guessing so. Um, in, including, I love the bit where the cops come up after he's stolen all the car generator batteries out of his right. neighbor's ha homes. And they're like, um, excuse me, sir, um, I own, I speak Spanish usually, but so excuse my poor English. Do you notice, like, anybody stealing your car battery? Well, actually, no, my car battery isn't stolen. Hmm, that's interesting. You're the only person on this block whose car battery wasn't stolen. Guess they didn't get you. Well, see you later. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck? And then, that just happened. As he closes the door, you're like, what is he? 
what is he reaffirming himself for? Clearly, he's in a city where there is no law, basically. <laughs> if there is, it doesn't work. Because, dude, I... Oh, man. I just really hated this movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's... I Because I love sci-fi movies, you know. Uh, this is just... It's so... There's so many cliches done in this movie, and there's zero payoff when it comes to most of the storylines they attempt to start. Right, it's a lot of just, like, instead of paying off a storyline, they introduce a new one. Yeah. That's sort of their gimmick. It's just like, uh, we don't know how to resolve this. Um, hey, let's introduce Keanu putting this needle eye thing into his eye so he yeah. can later make a copy of himself. Um, which I just gotta say, the the last image of, like you mentioned there, it, the last shot is, like, in Dubai. After we find out that Keanu has, like, his whole family life on the beach, and he cloned his other daughter. Yep. Um, so that all but resolved how and happily. Where? Uh, who knows? Um, but uh, meanwhile, uh, you've got in Dubai, John Ortiz, who had been beaten pretty harshly by this robot, is suddenly fine. And he's leading this old rich guy in a wheelchair, just like, oh, we can help you out. Isn't that right, William? And it turns to this robot in a Keanu Reeves suit, like he's in the John Wick fucking black suit. <laughs> which yeah. is such a... And he's like, start the sequence, and then that's the end of the movie. <laughs> Well, I get the idea that, like, the robot Bill or William whatever uh, cloned the Ortiz guy. Like, because he was dead, man. Like, he was leaking out of the head. Yeah, I, I would suppose so, yes. Yeah, but it it's doesn't still... matter. It doesn't change anything, right? It's still <laughs> stupid. It's still really fucking stupid, I guess. But, you know, I, I will also say this. We've kind of talked about off mic that uh, we've become not the hugest fans of Mr. Thomas Middleditch. Uh, but weirdly, I found his chemistry with Keanu surprisingly engaging. As like a sort of sidekick character for him, I, I actually kind of like their chemistry back and forth. I agree because I've I've not been the hugest fan of that dude for a while, especially because he seems to have most passion in like Verizon commercials as opposed to his movies. Um, at this point, yeah. Um, but I kind of like, especially the moment where Keanu's like, "Hey, can you pick the thing out of the bowl?" He's like, "No, dude, I'm not fucking doing that. You do that shit. I'm tired of this." Yeah, you know, and I. I argue that he might have given the most consistent performance in the whole movie, too. Mm -hmm. Where it was like, well, Alice Eve is kind of a wet blanket, usually, anyway. She's not that good of an actress. But they did they just did nothing with anybody in this movie. It was just, like you said, Keanu either hamming it up to a tenth of a degree or just walking, sleepwalking through it. Right, yeah. And this is the first time I've seen Alice Eve, honestly, in a while in the movie. Because I remember she was kind of like the new hotness around, like... About a decade ago? Yeah, and then, like, the last big movie I can think of her popping up in was that Star Trek sequel. Right, yeah, and that was, like, 2013, so it's been yeah. quite a bit. This was originally shot in 2016, and kind of made the rounds in festivals before it finally came out in 2019. Uh, so you, it kind of feels like a movie that's been shelved for a bit, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they didn't know what they wanted to do with this thing. No. They had no idea. And like I said, the fact that you could tell they were solely relying on the fact that it's Keanu Reeves in the movie. This is not what I would call a tight script whatsoever. So I don't know why maybe a couple passes weren't taken at it, like before it was finally going to get made. Yeah, this is just just a mess. It feels like it's more like they did take a lot of passes at it, but in the way that's like, this is Frankenstein from all the various different drafts that they did of it. Um, it, it feels more like that, where it's like there's so many different story threads that keep coming in out of it. It's like, this feels like it's been cobbled together from a lot of different scripts. I mean, that could be. That, that's probably exactly right. There's probably every producer who has a hand in it probably interjected their own little idea, too. And yep, all 35 credited producers. <laughs> that would make sense to me. Similar to a previous film we covered, Hurricane Heist, um, where it's just like, how many people are involved in this and how to just like whoosh away from theaters? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hurricane Heist. Ah, the good old days. <laughs> our, our beloved <laughs> Hurricane Heist. Our beloved Hurricane Heist. But yeah, I think we've uh, said all we need to say really about replicas, except for our final thoughts, and if you would say this is your least favorite film of the year so far, Adam. I wouldn't say it's my least favorite film of the year so far, because, again, like some of the other ones we've covered, I'm just not going to remember this one. It's so uneventful and unexciting and cliche and, like, literally... It, it reminds me of like that that one with uh, and the only reason I may remember it now is I'm trying to think of it is that uh, transcendence with Johnny Depp. Oh yeah, where it came out, saw it, don't remember it, don't remember anything that happened in it. This, this kind of is going to fall right along lines with that 
for me as far as like just basic sci-fi bullshit. Not my least favorite of the year, but it's just ultimately probably going to be one of the most forgettable for me. Um, yeah, it's definitely not my least favorite of the year. I think of nothing else because there's some of these little moments that I was intrigued by or entertained by. It, it feels definitely like sort of the movie that Keanu was doing more around like the early 2000s, where he just kind of felt a bit lost and directionless and not quite his star status. It feels more like a reject of that era. And uh, in, in a way where it's just like, it's, he's not quite consistent with the way he performs it. There's a lot of different just storylines that come in and out that don't ever really pay off any of them. Um, there's, like I mentioned, the, the entertaining bits uh, or the like the curious things that at least are like, well, that's unique for a sci-fi movie. I wish they did more of those as opposed to kind of, especially as the moment they go into that mode of like, oh my God, Joan Ortiz is after us. And there's like a car chase thing. That's where I was really starting to check out of it. Um, until once again, that robot was in that fucking suit. And you wouldn't do any work on that thing to try to like fix it up to make it look like a little bit better in the face. Like, <laughs> no, they had to spend all that money on that hologram technology. Adam. That's for, uh, it seems like all the money actually went, which is weird why they would spend that much money there. Uh, but it's, it's not quite the worst movie I've seen this year for, for sure. Um, on that, but let's go into uh, my pick for one of the best movies so far of the year. Our good feature, Us. Where's Jason? There's a family in our driveway. If you want to get crazy, we can get crazy. What are your people? It's us. So, Us is uh, the second film from Jordan Peele, who, of course, made a big splash after his big comedy career with, like, Keen Peele and stuff like that with the horror film Get Out, which was incredibly successful and incredibly well-celebrated, got him an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay, amongst other things. And uh, Us came out March 22nd, 2019, and um, was another production he did with Blumhouse. Um, that the basic premise of the story is Lupita Nyong'o plays a mother um, who goes out to the beach along with um, her daughter, her son, and her husband. Her husband being played by Winston Duke. They all go out to Santa Cruz to have a fun summer. Um, but there's a lot of stuff aching in the back of Lupita Nyong'o's head that pretty much is drawn directly from this incident that happened when she was a child in 1986. Um, and she met sort of a duplicate of herself that attacked her. And as is the result in this movie, um, a bunch of duplicates of not just her, but also her husband and her children come to them in the night, break into their home, and uh, start to speak of revolution for others in a similar sort of duplicate sensibility. Uh, as we continue to find out, there's a lot more of these us. Yeah. And they're one, basically one for everybody. Yes, including this other family that we meet, uh, which the weirdest couple of Elizabeth Moss and Tim Heidecker of Tim and Eric. Yeah. <laughs> and their twins. Yes, twin and daughters. their twin daughters, yes. Um, and I uh, would say Us is uh, a movie I saw opening weekend when it came out. And I know you also saw it as well, Adam, when it was actually in theaters. Yeah. This one has stuck with me, and especially upon this rewatch, I think it's gotten even better than the first time I saw it, I think because it's not quite Get Out, necessarily, in terms of how just perfectly executed that movie is, but mm -hmm. it shows also that Jordan Peele has so much attention to detail, while also at the same time being a very fun and engaging horror filmmaker that still includes a lot of comedy into this. Um, I think all the performances are so great, but particularly Lupita Nyong'o, I think, yeah, is oh, yeah. the strongest yeah. performance so far this year. And even, like, that first viewing, I had a lot of problems with sort of how the movie sort of got into its third act. Um, I think a lot of those problems have been absolved, with especially just rewatching it, considering a lot of the perspective stuff that happens and shifts um, once you get to the sort of ending reveal that happens there. But um, has anything changed for you, Adam? I know you weren't as excited about it when you first saw it, right? You liked it, but you had a lot more issues. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I like it more now than the first time, just because... I didn't go into it, on, obviously, on the second viewing, expecting anything. So I was able to maybe appreciate the things I missed before or didn't give too much thought to. No, I definitely really liked the movie. And it, my 
it's definitely built on the strength of uh, Lupita Nyong'o's performance as well. I mean, she's fucking fantastic in this movie um, as both roles. And I really noticed more of the black humor, dark comedy aspects to it this time than I did the first time. I mean, I knew it was funny, but I definitely noticed it and appreciated it a lot more this time. I think comparing this and obviously Get Out, which most other people do because he's the same director, you know, more of a black centric cast or storyline. They're so different. This one is frankly batshit crazy when you really get into it with what's going on. But uh, it's, it's also more overtly a horror film. Than get out yeah. necessarily is. I would argue both are horror films, but this one plays a lot more on especially sort of like the fantastical horror that's going on. Oh yeah, definitely. There's more of the uh, you know the violence and the slasher elements and things like that too. The costuming, the set design, the uh, score, especially. I mean, it's really top notch filmmaking, especially from a for a second film. Yeah, and it's credited to uh, Michael. Abels, who was also the guy who did the score for Get Out. Um, he especially, I love the way that he integrates a lot of, like, choir stuff into both Get Out and this movie, especially. Mm-hmm. The sort of, like, children uh, chants that are going on here are pretty uh, terrifying, for sure. Um, but, but yeah, I think, especially in terms of the stuff that's, like, different from Get Out, I think the biggest thing is, I heard some people kind of dismiss this movie earlier. It's like, oh, it's repeating a lot of the same themes as Get Out, which um, is, I think, blatantly false, in a lot of regard, I think it's only just because it's a, you know, a black filmmaker and it's an all, well, mostly a black cast. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they, they kind of paint it as like, oh, it's repeating a lot of these same things. But this movie definitely feels like it's a lot more about class in terms of what it's talking about. Because you can pretty much compare like a lot of the stuff with like our main family and even the Tim Heidecker, Elizabeth Moss family are much more well-to-do. Um, that it's versus the sort of the poverty-stricken, as it were, unfortunate circumstances of the doubles that are down there. It definitely feels like it's a class thing. Uh, there's obviously a lot of, like, there's the homeless guy that keeps popping up. There's definitely a lot of, like, that imagery um, where we kind of try and ignore these sort of problems that are going on or even just a lot of other things, like the girl even mentions the whole fluoride conspiracy theory thing. It's like no one cares about the end of the world. It feels like it's also kind of a metaphor for, like, uh, sort of things that we try and ignore that are going on they are slowly destroying <laughs> our own planet. And shit like that. Um, it, it feels like there's a lot of different metaphors that are going on here, but it's still strongly uh, rooted in the idea that like these other people, these others who we perceive to be like, oh, they're inhuman, they're monstrous, they're not like us. It's like, no, they are us. And I think that especially works for... The end of this movie has this weird thing where you've been rooting for somebody who you realize is the villain, but at the same time you kind of realize... In the circumstances she was in, you don't necessarily blame her for doing something that ruthless to get out of it. Uh, Yeah, right, exactly. And plus, it's like, were you really surprised by that, honestly? Um, The first viewing, it really started occurring to me around the time where, like, she kills the second twin in Elizabeth Moss's place, uh, where she starts getting to be a bit more animalistic, as it were. Mm -hmm. Um, it, It kind of recalled a lot of the stuff that the other doubles had done necessarily but at the same time it's one of those things where just because i might have predicted that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not so artfully done that i still respected no no i I agree with you yeah i just i just never saw it as a shock ending like to me i i saw it coming from a mile away it doesn't change the fact that it's still a good ending but i just don't understand i mean it must have surprised some people i guess right and if anything it, it just further emphasizes how much I love the red character that Lupin Nyong'o plays, I think, is one of the most interesting, tragic, monster characters in any of these horror movies as of recent. Because she has such interesting affectations, like, she based the sort of voice that she does off of, like, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and his own kind of, like, um, spasmodic uh, dysmorphia. That kind Mm -hmm. of um, speech impediment that he has. And it's so immediately engrossing. It kind of reminded me of like, a lot of these affectations, you can tell that one of the inspirations for uh, Jordan Peele was, like, an, an M. Night Shyamalan, but with a lot more of, like, an ideal craft and storytelling <laughs> that reminds you a lot more of his earlier movies, necessarily, than the later ones. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty accurate. This and Get Out are, I mean, what a strong pairing from, you know, a first-time director. It's like, I just, the sky's gonna be the limit for this guy, as far as what he can achieve. But, um, onto the movie at hand, I loved... The little touches, though, like the the glove, because Michael Jackson, 
You know what I mean? Right, because she's wearing the thriller shirt. And the yeah, shirt kind the of hands thing. across America thing. So that's why they all wear the red jumpsuits. Because the figures were red. Right, and even early on you see like the, the tapes of the Goonies and Chud. And how much mm-hmm. this place takes place later on down below. There's a lot of stuff where... Like, he did that Get Out, obviously, too. Where there's a lot of stuff that like does the cool sort of foreshadowing. Put a pin in that. You'll see that later kind of elements too and mm-hmm. even just like some of the choices like the whole thing where um lupita nyong'o's dance that you see when she's younger is actually a dance from the nutcracker that's meant to be a duet in the actual play i did not ever pick up on that that's pretty cool no right there's even the deleted scene where she talks about like oh i choreographed it as my own um single solo dance and it was one of the best moments of my life and how that eerily mirrors later on <laughs> where the girl does then she be- ends up becoming sort of like the leader for the tethered as things uh-huh. go along. But yeah, I, I would ask, aside from Lupita Nyong'o, who's so fantastic, who would you say um, does the best sort of job as, like, the scarier tether part? Probably the daughter. Uh, I, I don't know the, I'm sorry, I don't know the actress's name. She creeped me the hell out. And then Tim was really good, too. Shahadi Wright Joseph. There you go. Azora, yes. Oh, uh, yeah, she's she's really good, especially just the fact that she has no eyebrows. Mm-hmm. It makes her like face look so elongated, just taking the eyebrows off her. Right, and I like also how the tethered versions of these other people play off of the you know normal quote unquote versions of them so well. Where you have stuff like uh, my personal favorite, we have to probably be honestly Elizabeth Moss, um, as the evil version of herself, I think is so unsettling. But also how she has this fascination with beauty, uh, which mirrors how she talks about. Oh yeah, I had some work done. And later on, she's actually cutting herself with her scissors. Yeah, she was creepy. There's something about her period that just kind of creeps me out. I don't know what it is about Elizabeth Moss, but ever since, like, Mad Men, mm-hmm. I just find her unnerving. But yeah, she was really creepy. She, I, I liked her and uh, Tim's characters, where they're just so stereotypical, like, erudite, rich assholes who just drink all day and listen to shitty music, and their kids just run the house, basically. <laughs> Oh my god, someone's out there. It's OJ! It's OJ Simpson! Oh, that's fucking... <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you don't blame um, himself for stabbing himself later. And he's really creepy, especially when he's chasing down Winston Duke, and he's doing that mm-hmm. weird kind of, like, shuffle dance. Yeah. Steps. Yeah, and I, I hate Tim and Eric, but... Um, I fucking can't stand Tim and Eric. No, but in, I guess in better hands, um, he can actually be a very effective performer. Yeah, they they must know each other or something from the comedy days or I something. I assume, yeah. I mean, no, no one else would cast Tim in this type of role. But no, I thought they were all very... I mean, they were really kind of all very effective. I'd say the weakest one was probably Winston Duke, to be honest. Uh, just because he didn't really do much as the tethered one. He just kind of just stood there and looked tough. Which I guess maybe is the point, maybe. Because the real version's kind of a nerd. Well, right, he's a nerd and he's also a lot more boisterous. Mm-hmm. And a lot more... Which I love him, though, as the nerdy dad. I yeah, me too. so fucking good in that part. Especially when he's got that fucking boat and he's like, Craw Daddy! <laughs> Look mm-hmm. at me! <laughs> and all this other shit. Um, and we're, especially because like, he has to put on these airs about himself. But he ends up getting injured really early on and sort of incapacitated. So then his wife and his children have to kind of take up, especially the little boy, um, Evan Alex, I think is a really great as both parts because you get the sense as Jason, the child of the Adeline character, mm-hmm. um, he's a lot more quiet. He might have some sort of like social disorder that they don't quite say because he acts like he puts on the mask a lot. He's yeah. kind of quiet and shy, a lot more of an observer. And how that contrasts with Pluto, the red version of himself, and how much he's just like a little angry monster just going around and being very extroverted, but in a very nasty way. I just right. love how that contrasts with it. And how they also have a bit more of a connection where they do the whole like copying each other exactly right down to the fire thing later on. I mm-hmm. like how they kind of like did the setup and payoff for that as well. Just there's so many great sequences, especially. I think Jordan Peele has become a modern master of the horror uh, set piece in a way that really works right from like the moment where the two families meet each other. There's so much of like how, especially that feels so tense and horrific, but yet also seamless. And you don't see any of like the seams of the fact that it's like, oh, these are the same four actors playing off each other. But it doesn't feel that way at all. It feels like, oh, these are eight actors in the scene. Mm hmm. I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, we're done with the split screen effects. <laughs> Thank God, because that's always the worst in older movies where you can literally just see the line in between them. But they do use that in some places. I did love it. Watched, I got the Blu-ray, and apparently Jordan Peele oh, called those sequences. Oh, job, Mr. Rich Man. <laughs> Ooh. And a lot of these. I got se- the Blu-ray. 
I still own physical media, unlike you digital plebs. I ordered it out of the back of the New Yorker. Yep, after I've read those cartoons, I don't understand. <laughs> yep, uh, it's sent directly to my yacht. <laughs> my my little dinghy boat. My yeah, I don't know why you're rich, because you bought a Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love that um, they talk about how he, whenever they did have those sequences, like the scene where the two boys see each other in the mm -hmm. closet... Um, that is a split screen thing, and they called like the Haley Mills shot, which I thought was quite clever. Is it a Parent Trap or whatever? Right, Parent Trap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, but um, there's also the sequences where like uh, Lupita Nyong'o is like uh, as Red is pushing down Adeline's face onto the coffee table. Mm -hmm. Um, that is like a whole face replacement thing for like the other like Red is actually her stunt double, and they replace mm -hmm. the face seamlessly yeah i would have never even if watching it now i bet you can't really tell yeah no i i really dug it and like you said they there was enough twist uh from the regular performances to the tethered like you said to where it they never felt like even the same actor at all like especially again to you know sing her praise a little more but lupita nyong'o is well i guess she's not really the tethered the tethered would be the, nor the spoiler the normal one but um the red version is dude she's so scary <laughs> and then she's just so scary. And then the other version is so like in the beginning, so vulnerable and scared and shy and, you know, has a problem talking, which you find out why, obviously. It's a masterful execution into playing the same character, but just with a slight twist, you know, or, or not necessarily a slight twist, but taking all the, the one character's faults and problems and then amping them up to like 11. And right, yeah just getting these performances out of these actors. It, it, he cast the movie right, I'll tell you that. It's a hell of a cast. They all do a, They do all do a pretty good job, some more than others, but um, it's a strong cast because, I mean, I got to imagine the script was quite, like, a, obviously a strong script that would attract this caliber of actors, too. Right, right down to um, the guy who plays Lupita Nyong'o's father in flashbacks is, I'm, I'm going to butcher this name, I apologize, mm -hmm. um... Yaha Abdul Just say Black Manta. Mateen the second, right, yes, who is Black Manta. Um, and is gonna be the Candyman. When I saw certain scenes in this movie where he plays the tethered version of himself, um, I was like, Yep, that's Candyman. Like the way he yeah. does that evil smile when he like hands the t shirt over down below, I'm just like, Oh fuck. Yeah. This guy is so unsettling. I can't wait for him to play fucking Candyman. <laughs> yeah, dude, for sure. The first time I saw this, it, that was completely kind of lost on me that that was him. But he, it is kind of a bit role. Right, yeah, but he puts a lot into it, especially, I didn't realize, that dude has the broadest shoulders. Oh, he's a big, big man. He's like a fucking quarterback. Yeah, like, Jesus he's... Jesus Christ. <laughs> he's a big man. He he could uh, he could do some damage if he got a hold of you, which I know you want to happen. We don't have to talk about it. Look, he is a beautiful man. He is gorgeous. I don't disagree with that at all, no. Yeah, no, um, <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't mean you. Like, so you would go to him. <laughs> he, I mean, he's just like, be mine with that hook hand. Just did like, an oh. interview was like, yeah, no, Candyman is looking real fun. By the way, Thomas Mariani. <laughs> I'm coming for you, boo. I'll be his Virginia Madsen any day, obviously. Right. Um, but but no, yeah, I, I think they, they do such a great job of having all these people play, really, especially these other versions of themselves. Um, especially when Lupita Nyong'o is like playing off against herself in that climax, and there's that awesome split diopter shot where you see Red's face as you see Adeline in the background. Yes. Is, like, I think one of the best shots of the whole year. But the, that whole sort of dance that they end up doing, which obviously is mirrored with like the dance they did as children, it, it's so great that like he actually got like a former ballet dancer to choreograph a lot of those sequences, a lot of the movements for the tethered, and it really feels like these deliberate powerful motions that just display so much of like wanting to have this much power it's like they can only imitate these people through like these very performative dance steps and you can tell like all the other tethered have a similar sort of style of motion because like she ended up being their leader and choreographing their own way of getting up there and trying to like imitate humans and all this other shit it's just like it, there's so many layers to, like how this is being done where like some of the sort of logic might necessarily be completely intact but like some tethered imitate their others uh, sometimes they don't but at the same time like there's still sort of like a deliberateness to it that makes you kind of forget about that logic error of sorts where it's like i don't really give a shit because it's just really cool to see right. <laughs> and really speaks a lot about these tethered as actual human characters which is like i mentioned earlier i love the fact that the tethered by the end of the movie they're just like disenfranchised human beings who are just trying to, like, finally get out of the darkness. 
from this like sort of oppressed state where they were, where it's like they were grown and just like abandoned. And then they're just like, hey, we're just trying to get up and like rise up in the world. And that ominous shot at the same time is hopeful from their perspective. There's like so much playing there to where there's necessarily a bad guy in this movie. It's just two different groups of people who are in a society that either completely benefits them or completely fucks them over. And I think that says so much. It's a great example of how horror can be very intelligent and speak about stuff without being too necessarily preachy at the same time about it. I, I 100% agree with that. This never felt uh, preachy or like it was beating you over the head with anything. Being able to recognize the subtext and everything, of course, helps it uh, as far as the viewing goes. But I don't think that if you didn't pick up on any of that, I don't think it would necessarily ruin the movie. I think it's there for you if you want it. And if you don't really want to apply that to the plot, then I don't think you have to in order to enjoy the film. Right, it's also just incredibly entertaining in its own right. Mm-hmm. Right. It's that great balance where it's a crowd pleaser, but it does have something to say. Imagine that. Yeah. Oh. It's not a Marvel film, though. It's not a Marvel movie. That's true, and I mean, it only made like $255 million on a $20 million budget, so... <laughs> That's bullshit. That's <laughs> that's chump change. But I guess also, as a horror fan, Adam, um, mm-hmm. it's interesting where Jordan Peele sort of gave a list of ten movies to everybody working on the cast uh, to sort of, like, be an example of, like, what he wanted from the movie. And uh, I was curious if you thought this list, which includes Dead Again, The Shining, The Babadook, It Follows, A Tale of Two Sisters, The Birds... Funny Games, Martyrs, Let the Right One In, and Sixth Sense. Does that feel like all these different influences are felt in this movie? Uh, some more than others, definitely. But yeah, you can you could really pick up on a lot of that. I'd say as far as like Babadook is all over this movie. Sixth Sense, Shining, all over this movie. So yeah, no, I, I definitely feel like maybe some of those not like the birds, I guess I get for like the maybe just the outside work where it's like, the chaos that's happened and things like that, but mm-hmm. that's a pretty comprehensive list, man. That's a pretty good one. And did you also catch the the reference that they did at the opening? No. They're at Santa Cruz and they're at the sort of boardwalk. Carnival. Oh yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Lost Boys, right? And they, well, and they literally say at one point because it's nineteen eighty six, like, hey, they're filming something over by the carousel. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I did catch that. Sorry, I, I did, forgot, but yeah, I caught that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, Jordan Peele, he knows his horror movies. He loves his horror movies. I mean, it's obvious the guy's a huge fan. That's why I said I'm excited to see where he's going to go next. It's kind of refreshing to have a not only a, like a brand new take on the horror genre, but one that's actually proven can do quality work. It's not like another out-of-nowhere Blumhouse sort of director. Right, even though he is a Blumhouse director. Right, but I'm saying like, like Ma or, you know, one of those or the... It's not a fucking remake. Right. Like, it's original material that's actually worth a damn. Yes, so why don't you go ahead and segue then to your final thoughts then on us, Sen? Well, as a fan of the horror genre, I really, really like this movie. As a fan of movies in general, I really enjoy this movie. It's not necessarily my favorite of the year, but it, it'd probably be up there. But if you just want to see, like, honestly, if you're only curious in it to see Lupita Nyong'o pull off the dual performance, then it's totally worth your time. If you're... Wanting to see it for great cinematography, cool score, that ballet scene, though, and things like that, then you you can't go wrong with this movie. This is a very, very competently made, smart horror movie. Yeah, I mean, it's it's my second favorite of the movie of the year so far. I think there's there's so much detail. It's like Get Out, where you know so much more with each time you watch it. Like, I'm glad I got that Blu-ray, because I want to watch this again and again, just to really get so many of the different finer details they keep occurring here, and it's got an amazing cast, not just the Nyong'o, but everyone else there. I do hope Get Out managed to, you know, despite having the Oscars be, like, a year after that movie came out, get some award nominations. I really hope, especially Lupita, gets, like, some award recognition for this movie with how just stellar her performance is, where it's not just that, oh, she's a super creepy performance, but actually there's so much pathos and tragedy in either side of that performance that's just... So spellbinding to watch. It's um, it, it's such a really meticulously well made movie that's incredibly entertaining, but also has a lot more to say when you do want to scratch a bit more beyond the surface. And it is not at all like a, a quote unquote repeat of Get Out or a lesser movie. This is not a sophomore slump by any stretch. And I'm so glad to see this dude keep making movies and them being especially really successful. I like the fact that these movies have actually been like sort of 
a major talking point and stuff like tethered has become part of the popular consciousness and shit like that. And I've seen like cosplays and stuff of like twins dressing up as like tethered and other versions of themselves. I, I really love that that's happening. I really like that this guy's making a huge impact on pop culture and just actually movies that make people actually discuss things in really interesting ways uh, with original material that's su- incredibly successful. So yeah, us definitely one of my favorites of the year. We'll probably stick around as the year continues onward. Yeah, I don't see much coming out that's going to maybe take its spot, to be honest. What, what are you talking about, Adam? There's, there's so much. Hobbs and Shaw? Oh, <laughs> fucking hell. Right. I'm honestly really excited for Hobbs and Shaw. <laughs> yeah, that's, I guess Keanu Reeves might be in that. I've heard rumors. Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard as much. But that is the end of our discussion of our two films for 2019. Uh, but every Monday on the Facebook and Twitter page I previously mentioned, at Pod. We like to ask you all, hey, what are your favorite and least favorite movies that relate to the topic that we're doing? So we asked all of you out there, hey, what are your best and worst movies of the year so far? So uh, first up, we have uh, former guest Shaquille Lambert. says, best, Endgame, John Wick Chapter 3, Toy Story 4, Godzilla, even though I'm in the minority on this. I also wanted to give a special mention to Climax. Gaspar Noé managed to make his edgelord style palpable, uh, while also delivering some of the most impressive and hypnotic sequences this year, especially the opening dance number. Worst Polar is a miserable experience, not just for being a complete waste of Mads Mikkelsen's talent as a lead, but also trying to blend a dark, quiet thriller with Suicide Squad tier wackiness. Um, Scott Johnson says, Us, Booksmart, Avengers Endgame, and Toy Story 4. Worst Dumbo probably won't be the worst movie of 2019, but especially the big muck-up in terms of a remake that could genuinely improve on the original, and Tim Burton added some half-baked ideas and terrible child actors. Uh, James Rodriguez um, said, I adored Us, a socially relevant piece of horror, which rewarded on multiple viewings. A special mention is deserved for One Cut of the Dead, uh, which begins with a 37-minute one-take before the following hour reveals brilliant layers for the zombie movie slash love letter to the filmmaking. And then there's Hellboy, a flaming disaster, which takes the wrong lessons from Deadpool, trying to be edgy with an overall regret message of stop crying and grow a pair uh brian kane says the standoff at sparrow creek is a great suspense film that's like a stage play um it's a debut film from a director henry dunham um that i can't wait to see more from captive state was about as exciting as a senate filibuster cool alien designs though and yeah the mikhail says favorites not involving avengers or evil twins book smart uh billy lord steals every scene climax don't watch this one while you're high Uh, High Life, can people who just watch blockbusters stop bitching about Robert Pattinson? Not so favorites, uh, not involving Sophie Turner. Uh, Pet Cemetery, you forgot this came out, didn't you? Velvet Buzzsaw, maybe Nightcrawler was all Dan Gilroy had in him. Serenity, seeing is believing. Um, And then he actually added an addendum to his comment where he said, I just got out of The Last Black Man in San Francisco, and it's my new number one for the year. If you enjoyed Blind Spotting or Moonlight, which he discussed on his previous episodes where he was a guest, check it out. I have no idea what that movie's about. I'm assuming I know what it's about by the title, but I'm definitely interested. Um, It's about a white man in Los Angeles? Yeah. I know, it's crazy. (laughs) Yeah, and then... uh... You know, Endgame I love, Endgame, but it just, I mean, of course, that's on most people's list. It's just such a spectacle. I, if I got to throw out there my favorites of the year so far, and least favorites, Pet Cemetery is definitely there for one of my least favorites. I fucking hated that movie. And if you uh, talked about that on the Horror Returns episode, or oh, tried to. Oh, what a, <laughs> yeah, try to. What a vapid, soulless piece of shit. Lance Langford is, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will say like, I didn't get a chance to talk about it obviously because I wasn't on that episode. Sure. Um, but I had the weird experience where I really like the first half of that movie. Mm-hmm. I think they actually were sort of doing something that felt a lot closer to the book than the original movie did. And I was just like, Oh, I'm actually really engrossed and interested and curious to see where this goes. And then I think right around where they sort of do their twist on what happens, it starts really falling apart. I think especially because, yeah spoilers, I guess, even though the trailers fucking reveal this, they have the daughter die instead of the young boy, Gage. And whereas in the actual story, that means a lot more because it's like a unspeakable horror through a child that can't speak that much. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a young girl who can just spell out everything that's fucking going on with the themes, and it's mm. so dumb. Yeah, and when she's the evil version of Ellie, just the stereotypical bullshit that's coming out of her mouth when she's attacking 
the father and stuff. It's just... Ugh. Yeah, and especially because it's like... They keep going where it's like all these other twists where it's like, oh, we're doing our own definitive stamp on the story. It's like, yeah, but you're making it like a dumber story. Yeah, you're making it a zombie slasher movie. Right, as opposed to it was a story about a man grieving where it's right. just... It's, it kind of felt like, oh man, the first half I was watching like one of the best Stephen King adaptations ever, and then by that second half I was like, this is one of the worst. Yep, I like, agree. Like, it's so incredibly uneven to me. Uh, but as far as like the top of my list, I throw Shazam up there. Mm-hmm. I really, really love Shazam. Um, I really love Alita. You know, things like that. Granted, they're more of the blockbuster type movies, but, you know, I go to the theater, that's what I'm going to watch. But as far as, even just to go back to Shazam, Shazam is... You know, Aquaman was really a step in the right direction, and I feel like Shazam just sort of cemented what the DC film universe needs to be. Just, you know, fun. Stop taking yourself so seriously all the time. You're you're allowed to have comedy. Just because Marvel does a fun movie doesn't mean you can't as well. Uh, Nobody wants to see a Superman movie where it's super dark and, you know, dread and depressing. Nobody wants that. Yeah, it felt it felt like a more interesting Superman movie than yeah. what they've attempted to do. Really, yeah, and Zachary Levi is so fun in that part. Oh, he's he's fucking perfect in the role. I was so unsure at first, but yeah, no, he's fantastic in it. Yeah, and it's also interesting because like it felt like it's one of the rare examples where the best part of a superhero movie is the third act, like mm-hmm. when they have that reveal. Like spoilers once again, all of the fellow foster kids end up being the superheroes in the same Shazam way. I was so just delighted by that. I was mm-hmm. I loved how that really played out in all the other versions, like Adam Brody and Megan Good especially were so fun. Yeah. <laughs> those other versions of their characters. Um and also it's so great that it's like it's a mainstream bigger movie that deals with like foster families as like a regular thing. Yeah. And the foster parents aren't dicks. No, yeah, they're really nice, awesome people. <laughs> yeah, no, I and you know, even Mark Strong as the bad guy was fine. Was he a strong villain? Not necessarily, but... Uh, I just realized what I did there. <laughs> um, but no, he worked fine. Like, it, did, he didn't feel like a throwaway character to me. Like, I got it. And I think that it was smart opening the movie with his backstory. Right, with uh, another great thing. Uh, just any movie that uses Julian Glover well in this day and age is... Yep. Well worth it. <laughs> yep, I'm sold. It's... He's so great as an asshole. <laughs> oh, he's the perfect prick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say, um, I think several of the people mentioned their feedback, like uh, some of the other ones. Like I mentioned before, High Life is my favorite movie of the year so far. Mm-hmm. Which, if you don't know what that is, it's Robert Pattinson at the opening is on a space station alone except for an infant. And from there, they reveal a nonlinear way about the past of like why he's there and how this child came to be, basically. Um, and it's such, I think, an incredibly interesting movie basically it feels like it's about sort of trying to keep on going in the state of desperate sort of terror about the future um yeah you could just film my day to day (laughs) that's uh, what you want to see beautiful movie i I really loved it and like um jonathan said as i've said previously um it's it's a phenomenal performance from pattinson especially when he has to just essentially play off this infant co-star um it's quite amazing just like how really effective and emotional that dude can be and really empathetic as an actor. I mean, also like end game, obviously I agree with, I think that is, um, it's sort of a great season finale, but it also works. as just like a huge culmination. There's like so many great performances. There's another one where it's like, these movies don't usually get much beyond like Oscar nominations for special effects, but if nothing else, like as a career thing alone, Downey Jr. Is so phenomenal in that movie. Yeah. He deserves some kind of recognition. Definitely. Something. Yeah, um, I know Booksmart was one that, like, I think more people I wish they would have seen. It does play like it's a modern super bad, but with, I think, a lot more of, like, an emotional core that works. It's Olivia Wilde's debut as a director, and I think she did an amazing job. Billy Lord, as mentioned in here, um, she plays a side character who the two main female characters uh, are, like, going through, like, a bunch of different parties on the last day of high school. And um, she plays, like, the sort of drugged-out hippie character, and it feels a lot weirdly like uh, she's channeling stuff from her own mom, Carrie Fisher. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I always forget for some reason that Billy Lord is her daughter. Yeah, she's so fun in that movie. That whole movie's great. Um, but other stuff like Toy Story 4 I was really surprised by. They ma- actually managed to do a really good job uh, with a fourth movie that I didn't think necessarily needed to be made. They did a great job with. 
Um, Always Be My Maybe, we previously mentioned, but I think that's a great romantic comedy uh, with Randall Park and Ali Wong, who are great, and then Keanu shows up and he's fun. Um, Rocket Man, I thought was really underrated. I thought that it's the much better Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, Happy Death Day to You, I thought was a way better sequel, and it's like a fun, more of like a sci fi uh, comedy story that kind of plays like a modern Back to the Future sequel, than necessarily a uh, slasher horror comedy thing that the other one was, but it really works. I would also like to give a shout out to something like uh, The Long Shot, which I thought was surprisingly really good, the Charlie Theron Seth Rogen movie. It was interesting how like their chemistry, weirdly, was more believable than the most unbelievable thing in the movie, which is like Seth Rogen's college buddy is played by O'Shea Jackson Jr. <laughs> yeah. Because, sure, they're the same age. Right. Obviously. But in terms of bad stuff, I mean, Jonathan mentioned Serenity, and I it's a terrible movie, but I wish we really covered it on the show because it's so fucking entertaining. <laughs> we will. It is such a baffling movie where I won't reveal the twist here because that kind of was the reason I heard about this movie. <laughs> Um, but, uh, it's Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway being in, like, a really bad film noir movie, and you're like, why is this happening? And you're like, oh, that's why this is happening. Yeah. But why <laughs> is this happening now? <laughs> right. It literally becomes a completely different movie halfway through. That's bizarre. Um, but yeah, Cap to State was previously mentioned. That was terrible. Really just like Velvet Buzzsaw, too, because it's from the Dan Gilroy who made Nightcrawler, and it's such a, like, it, the way that I described it is, like, Imagine a Dario Argento movie with a cast of characters from, like, a Noah Baumbach movie as made by Tom Ford. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty pretty terrible, yeah. And also, I will say, um, I have a review up on my blog right now for a movie called Yesterday, which was the Danny Boyle film that just came out recently. Um, and that is a steaming pile of shit. It looked like it was going to be a steaming pile of shit. Yeah, but it's just like, hey, what if the Beatles never really existed um, in this world? And that's sort of a backdrop for a really bad romantic comedy. Uh, yeah, that looks dumb. Yep, that was really dumb. Uh, <laughs> but what wasn't dumb was all of you giving us that feedback. We thank you all for that. Uh, we also thank Chris Oliver for the intro and outro music used in our show. Listen to more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Thanks to Emily Scarda for the art that uh, she provided for our show she accepts commissions at 502hours.com slash ee scarta and you can find us like i said at dedb pod on facebook and twitter those are our pages where we put up those feelers about what are your least favorite and favorite movies from our topics and you can also email us with feedback uh, double edge double bill at gmail.com or you can um send some feedback my way to my own individual account at not the who's tommy um and i also do writing at mariani thomas at wordpress.com where i put up that yesterday review amongst other things and you can also find Adam below the Santa Cruz Carnival eating rabbits. Yeah, but not like in a malicious way, just because, hey, free rabbits. I thought it was really interesting when Lupita Nyong'o was like going around trying to find her double and she just saw you there. You're like, hey, yeah, hey listen, rabbit. Hope you don't mind. Real good lean meat. <laughs> and for more uh, rabbit eating material like that, you can subscribe to us on the various different platforms. We're on Spotify, we're on YouTube, we're on Stitcher. Uh, we're on iTunes uh, for as long as that's around. Um, and if you rate and review us there, or at least try and share the show around, that uh, would really benefit us. We'd really appreciate that, because it gives us more visibility and gets more people to download and have fun with the show. Yeah. Help us out. I don't know why I became Mark Wahlberg doing that. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Hey. You. Yeah. Go ahead. Help us out. Let's share the show to your mother for me. Yeah, say hello to your mother for me. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, but... Before we leave, Adam, um, it is time to do what we always do at the end of the show, which is pick our movies for next week. So, if you're new, um, at the end of every show, Adam and I each have two movies of two different qualities, and um, we both assign numbers between 1 and 10 for those, and we um, numbers between 1 and 10 for those choices. So you end up picking the good and bad movie for the topic that we're doing, and uh, we're going back to a topic we've done before, which is the concept of overrated and underrated so overrated would be the bad choices that i have two of mm -hmm. and adam has the two good choices or underrated which is the reverse of the last time we did this uh so we get a chance to see each other's perspectives on this and i'll say this much adam this was one of the hardest i've actually honestly done for the show i was looking through like all the different choices that i would consider overrated i didn't have a lot Really? Oh, it's almost as, yeah, I know. It just feels like I like movies too much, Adam. I guess you, I hate on stuff a lot more than you. I guess that's that is true. Uh, <laughs> but I managed to find two for myself, and I'm sure you found two underrated as well. Oh, sure. Yes. So, for your two underrated choices, 
I'm going to pick number six. Okay. At number eight, I had uh, a movie we've talked about off mic before, uh, Strange Days with Ray Fiennes. Fuck yes! <laughs> Great! Yeah, oh. love that movie. <laughs> so awesome. Really happy about that. Number two, I had uh, the Paul Walker running scared. I have not seen them, and I've heard good things about that. I argue it's easily Paul Walker's best movie or performance, but it's a fun, like, kind of just crazy action movie. But yeah, Strange Days, though. Really happy to hopefully expose more people to that movie. Cause yeah, so for sure. Yes, but we'll talk about that next time. But now I'm uh, for my two. Uh, I'm picking number between that. one and ten. Okay, I'll go number two. All right, you know, at number three, it's a movie we've talked about not just earlier in this episode, but also just Fuck in uh, <laughs> previous episodes. One that a lot of people I know like, um, that I haven't liked even since I was a kid. It is the 1985 beloved cult classic, The Goonies. <sighs> I remember really liking The Goonies, so but I haven't seen it in a long time. Yeah, we'll see. Wow, that's interesting. That's it. You yep. know what, though? Hey. If you're going to go for it, go right for the gullet. One of them hot takes, I know, the kids love talking about. Uh, But my other choice was another one the kids love, especially a lot of people around my age. Um, At number seven, I had Step Brothers, the Will Ferrell movie. I like that one, too. I I don't really like that movie that much at all. I can understand why. No, I I completely understand why. It's stupid. Yeah, it's just like, I'm also not the hugest fan of Will Ferrell's starring vehicles outside of Anchorman. I think after that, a lot of those movies I think are very overrated. Yeah, I oh I 100% agree with you. I think most of them are. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, this will be interesting. Strange Days in the Goonies, huh? Let's see if what is good enough. Uh, 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 well, on uh, that note, we need to... Uh... <laughs> that whimper. Yes, on that, on that note, uh, let's get into our red jumpsuits and uh, grab our golden scissors, Adam. Long live the giant condor! Spooky.